Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is the fourth lecture in our Imagining Otherwise lecture series. So titled after Lola Olufemi's Experiments in Imagining Otherwise, this lecture series brings together practitioners across disciplines whose work uh, explores themes of identities and centering the margins. It acknowledges and champions lived and embodied experiences, decolonial epistemologies, and decarbonizing spatial and non-spatial discourse. We continue to navigate the space between what is and what could be, and the possibility of living otherwise. The series is chaired by Bushra and Nana from Diploma Unit 2, and from Diploma 13, myself and George, who's unable to join us this evening. And we're joined by Asme Lashteka Hatbu. Um, Asme is the co-founder and CTO of Lesan and a fellow at the Distributed AI Research Institute. He has built state-of-the-art machine translation systems uh, to and from Amharic, Tigrinya, and English. He completed his PhD at the Leibniz University in Hanover, where his research focused on machine learning for applications in scholarly communication, crisis communication, and natural language processing in low resource settings. His work engages with questions of equal access to information across languages and across different age groups. Asme's presentation will be followed uh, by a discussion uh, with Nana Bushra and myself, and then we will take questions uh, after that from the audience. And because we're on Zoom, everyone is automatically muted. So if you want to ask a question, if you could use the raised hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screens or paste your questions in the chat and we can ask them. Uh, and I will now hand over to Asme. Right. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Fantastic. Let me... Um, share my screen and the slides. All right. Well, thank you so much for the warm introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here today and um, share a part of what we've been thinking around um, this internet for our grandmas as a, as a part of uh, imagining the future series at, at the Deer Institute. Um, and great, so let's just dive in. <clears throat> I will start with a bit of a personal story. And uh, at the middle of the, the presentation, I will talk about the current state of the internet and some of the technological features that we're imagining, uh, not only imagining, but also really creating um, to curb some of the problems. So you might have heard of Tigray um, in Ethiopia. Uh, over the past couple of years, there has been a genocidal war, and I mentioned this because my parents live there and most of my formative years, I actually, I was born and raised in, in Tigray. And that has pretty much shaped uh, to what I do today. Um, and yeah, there's there's a lot more about the context of Tigray that I would come back and forth. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, and a special mention to two special people uh, in relation to this uh, presentation. Uh, for those of you uh, from the architecture department, School of Architecture, this is the slide I have that, uh, that has uh, some of the architecture integrated that you, know, you might relate with your technical expertise. Um, but it's also a village where my mom was born and raised. Uh, her parents uh, were born and raised. And for me, Adoa Zahaitu, my great grandmother, uh, was born and raised. Um, I didn't have um, grandparents, so even though I named the presentation under the internet for my grandma, uh, in my in my head and heart, it's really about my great grandmother, the only one I had, Adoa Zahaitu. And what I remember about her growing up as a child is the you know bedtime stories she told us, uh, or some of the word plays um, like hankhankolite or nkazgeneni. These are kind of like word plays in Tigrinya, where you know one player gives you a word and you have to answer with a rhyming word or expression that also makes um, some sense. Um, and I'm also lucky. I'm a father. Uh, to my son here, my two-year-old son, Nolawi. And uh, I'm currently based in uh, Berlin. I live in Germany. And so there are so many um, bedtime stories in German and in English. And I always wonder, oh, um, I wish there were 
you know, bedtime stories in Tigringa because there aren't many of them. And I always think about my great grandma and always imagine, um, I wish we built something to keep those kind of uh, stories so my son could hear those. Um, but it's not just only my great grandma or my, my grandma. Uh, over generations, our elders have, have served as technologies of memory way before the invent of uh, the internet or the printing press. They passed down our stories uh, of our history, our family trees, our poetry and music to keep our heritage alive. And they maintained our culture and sense of our identities. <clears throat> so let's switch gears and talk about the current context in terms of the internet as we know it today. And I will use the context of Tigray, Tigrinya, and Amhari. These are the languages uh, spoken in Ethiopia, where I come from. But I think many um, people from Africa, from if, you know, many African countries can, can relate uh, to these. Let's start with a giant search engine. You know, how many of us go to Google and, and get, you know, our search needs met uh, by typing in queries to, you know, a multitude of questions. Um, unfortunately, if you try to do search for Hamam Libi, which is um, heart disease, uh, this is among the top 10 causes of disease, uh, death in Ethiopia, um, you know, it points you to some random YouTube videos or some news stories about a specific kind of heart attack, uh, but it doesn't really you know, give you the kind of quality information that we get in English, like symptoms of heart disease um, or you know, what to do about a certain type of heart disease and so on. And this is not just about Google search. Uh, if you go to Bing, uh, it's it's the same. Uh, results are similar. Uh, they're, they're broken and they don't give you uh, information that's useful about this disease. If you look into knowledge repositories such as Wikipedia, um, I use the same running example, uh, Hamam Libi, there's no entry for, for this, uh, for this article on, on Wikipedia. And, you know, search, search engines and others rely on this kind of knowledge repositories to serve us uh, results. And just because there's no entry, they won't be able to, uh, they won't be able to um, give us result, good results uh, if we search for Hamam the Bee. But we can imagine more, right? Uh, I was mentioning this bedtime stories and, and others, this kind of, um, you know, oral histories, uh, you don't you don't kind of find them in conventional ways, at least on the current uh, internet. Social media uh, is full of hateful content. If you look, uh, what you see on the screen is a, a professor talking and using a, a term Wayana, which is basically anyone from Tigray, especially in the context of the, the war that has been going on over the past couple of years. Um, calling them cancer. And you see this on social media because social media sites, um, unlike the ones we, we know, I mean, saying uh, it's like ones who predominantly use it in English, um, posts in Tigringa and Amharic, uh, even if they are harmful uh, or in this case really um, hateful, uh, they, they are still there. Uh, this is another screenshot from Twitter. Um, another person talking about uh, or TPLF as a cancer. And again, this was the code name people used during the war in Ethiopia to refer to anyone who comes from Tigray. And this is clearly uh, a hateful message, um, but it was on, on Twitter shared uh, large and wide. And, and you, even if you report this, you know, it takes forever or it doesn't uh, get taken down. Who hasn't heard about Chat GPT these days? It's all over the news. Um, and Chat, G, uh, Chat GPT and, and other chat technologies are, um, in a way, promising many things for English and relatively some European languages, such as uh, German. Um, and here is a screenshot, uh, a conversation really between me and, and ChatGPT. I asked ChatGPT a very simple question, list examples of African countries in Tigringa. And what you see, the output is a complete gibberish. It has some words in Tigringa, Abinetat, Hagarat, Africa. And then there are words like in the same sentence um, that are in Amharic, uh, like 
negaroch nacho in the first sentence. Um, but all in all, it doesn't make sense. It's a complete gibberish. And I mentioned all these things to highlight uh, how current technology, uh, including search, is broken or information repositories um, are scarce for some languages. Social media is really full of hateful content and chatbots are simply utterly useless uh, for these languages. And um, we can talk about some of the likely reasons. Um, and one of the themes I would like to bring up uh, for discussion today is really the intent uh, behind uh, building any technology, really. Um, what drives somebody to create a technology? And for me personally, it's that connection to my community, to Tigray, to the place where I grew up, to my community. And uh, for others, it could be many other things. All right. Uh, so for the for the later part of the, the the presentation, I will focus on some of the language technologies that we're reimagining um, for future. So our grandmas and others can uh, equally participate, uh, contribute to the web, uh, and we will be able to um, benefit from that. So what you see on this screen uh, on the right is the uh, the Goose script. It's a distribution of the different characters of the Goose script. Um, there are over 350 characters in Gez. These are kind of scripts uh, used by a dozen languages uh, spoken in the Horn of Africa. And these are kind of like the technology, um, language technologies for these languages that we work uh, predominantly uh, at Lisan and, and also DARE. So I will highlight some language technologies that we're currently working on, starting with language identification. So language identification is the simple task of like you're given different different takes from different um, languages and your question is to figure out the question mark on the left what language is this so in a way something like this the first one is Amharic the next one is Aungi and then Giz Harari and so on um, because all of these use the Giz script many uh technology companies today, whether it's search engines or social media companies, do not recognize which is which. So they combine all of these uh, things in one, uh, as if um, if I can give you a parallel, any language that uses the Latin script is basically uh, packaged up in, in as, as one language, basically. And this is basically a very simple, um, very simple problem really to solve. But it shows uh, if you know you're not determined to, or if the intent is not really to solve for a particular society or for a, for a particular community, um, even advanced, uh, you know, big companies with you know the resources to solve these problems, don't solve them. The next one is uh, optical character recognition. So um, these highlands of Ethiopia, Integrai, and and in Eritrea um, have literally traditions, uh, literary traditions that run for thousands of years. So um, we are a people that have invented our own characters and have used them to pass on our stories, our, our religion, um, and so on. And they're all now locked in, you know, paper copies. Um, so the optical character recognition would help us to digitize these things, to search them, to study them, uh, and to relate to them. Um, Another, uh, another technology we're working on, speech recognition, automatic speech recognition. And this, we believe, can unlock a lot of possibilities, especially from, you know, uh, languages such as Tigringa and Amharic, where, you know, the majority of the people are not literate. They can't read and write, um, not only just on paper, but, you know, these 250 more than 350 characters, if you have to use the standard keyboard, um, then it becomes tricky to use these uh, key combinations to kind of even write your name in this in this uh, languages. But anyone can use their language and uh, automatic speech recognition technology when designed properly can um, help, you know, uh, democratize access uh, to, to the contribution of content for, for these communities um, that don't necessarily have the the capability to, to type on these conventional keyboards. The other one is machine translation. In fact, at Lisan, this was the first technology we worked on. The hypothesis being that, you know, personally, being myself, um, 
having gone through the benefit of like the web and the internet, the wealth of information in English. And I couldn't help but uh, think only if we had machine translation and if we can, you know, translate all of this content and make it available uh, for our communities. And that was the kind of first technology we worked on. It's important to highlight machine translation has a very um, dark history of the beginning. It was actually uh, when, you know, reading about the history of machine translation, uh, one comes across the intent of uh, governments and uh, states uh, that wanted to build this technology to spy on other, you know, states and, and, and governments. I think it's important to remember, and this is why my first kind of like motivating um, theme was our grand mass with the right intentions. Uh, if we create these technologies with the right intentions and um, for the right communities, they could be they could have the tremendous potential for good. But we also have to know that they can be abused. Um, you know, if uh, they are built for for different purposes. So here is a screenshot of Lisan. Um, the, on the left, you see a snippet from Wikipedia about signs, and on the right is the automatically translated snippet into Grinia. I don't think it's perfect, um, but it's really good enough to be useful. And that's just the beginning. As time goes on and as the community embraces this technology and as we carve what needs to get translated, what's useful for us, I, I can only imagine uh, the good we can do to, to our community with this technology. Right, so um, I have tried to highlight a few kind of language technologies um, relating to how they could be useful in kind of helping us reimagine the web and, and the internet. Uh, for example, to enable us to access the web in our languages, how machine translation can open that up uh, and to help us have a uh, safe social media experience, starting from learning how to identify different scripts and different languages uh, and going up into deeper understanding of others and maybe imagining into multimodal and accessible uh, kind of web, regardless of literacy. And I hope that speech recognition and related technologies can help us uh, democratize that front. Um, so in the not long... Um, so long future, we will be able to have our grandmas record their uh, bedtime stories. And then people uh, like myself can search them in their language and make them available so they can play them for their kids. Right. Uh, and I have one unifying question really for you all. What drives you? Because what drives us with good intentions can actually bring up useful uh, products and, and and services to the world. Thank you. All right, if you have any questions, now we can open up. I probably have finished much faster than, than planned. I didn't have my notes, sorry. <laughs> I had to just kind of, <laughs> yeah. That's great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, that was brilliant. Um, I, I have, a, I mean, it's really fascinating to hear about the work that you do and um, the work that Dare does as well. I think it's a really uh, important topic right now. And um, uh, I think my question was around this idea of, of language diversity or, or kind of um, keeping my, minority languages alive and um, how linguistic diversity has actually been linked, I think, through a few studies with biodiversity of our natural world. And I was wondering if um, that's a consideration for you and the work that you do at Lesan and, and DARE, like how you balance the kind of physical with digital space. That's a wonderful question. Um, and I wish I could read a bit more about that connection. But um, absolutely, at the core of what we do is really, you know, instead of treating these languages such as Tigringa and Amharic and, and the other languages that our communities speak as add-ons, 
um, which is the current practice of you know big tech and, and other companies where they solve they put all of the resources on the you know on English or a few European languages and then okay we'll work on the other languages. We want to be we want to tackle this uh, you know to center these these languages uh, at the at the heart of like our, what we do mm. and our motivation basically is just our roots is basically how can we enable our communities to open up access for them for knowledge how can we link them we, i drive uh, my knowledge of my history from my ancestors from you know my my grandparents and elders mm -hmm. if we can make uh, some of these technologies available by being able to allow them to share those stories you know we will help flourish our our culture mm -hmm. and so yeah, with the physical, I think I think that's an interesting perspective. I, I probably need to check a bit more on that, but definitely on you know cultural preservation and you know uh, opening up opportunities for for communities. This is at the center of why we do what we do. Really, could you speak a little bit more about the process of um, what you do when? Um after you develop you're developing these kind of digital systems is is there a process of kind of going back to um the village in Tigray and to Ethiopia or Eritrea and um working with communities on the ground that's an excellent question when i got started with lisan some 3 years ago the first thing we did was we just went uh, to the ground. We went to Tigray. We went to Ethiopia, to Addis, and we um, met uh, our community. We told them we were going to build this, and people were enthusiastic. They helped us with whatever data they had. Uh, everyone was willing to you know, support us in, in building these technologies because they saw the potential. Unfortunately, as I told you, uh, shortly after uh, war broke out, so there was no way for me, at least physically, to to travel there. Um, and only recently, like in you know a few a few months ago, uh, where I only able to hear the voice of my parents uh, for the first time in a very long time. So with that situation in mind, uh, I couldn't go and physically work with my community as much as I wanted to, um, but things are changing and I'm very optimistic that, you know, when when uh, things are fully uh, peaceful, I can't wait to go and, and share the technology and continue to co-create this. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. And I really like the um, provocation at the end about what drives drives us. Um, I suppose my first question is in relation to, to exactly this, what, what drives you in terms of how, because your practice seems to be shifting the internet from a kind of resource of just kind of um, sharing or just asking questions or receiving kind of information in this kind of open format that is not uh, kind of crit critical or positioned. And it seems like your work is trying to prioritize other forms of kind of um, knowledge systems or sharing knowledge that's more passed down than maybe just the kind of get, trying to get from A to B. And I wondered what role kind of um, storytelling or reframing existing knowledge um, drives um, how that um, is included in your work. And then also thinking about um, how language, um, the nuances of language that are skipped in English. So lots of African languages really there are words that you can't describe um, using an African in, in African languages. I think of um, architecture quite a lot and how a lot of African languages don't have a word for that. So there's a kind of gap in the kind of um, how one is able to express themselves. So I wondered how you work with these kind of ideas and tensions in, in your in your work. That's an excellent question and a very loaded one. <laughs> Maybe I can attempt the you know nuances of yeah. nuances of a language. This is an excellent question because um, it brings me to this idea of who should create a language technology. Actually, um, you know, 
current the current practice is a few companies, mostly situated in Silicon Valley, that have the resources, um, are able to um, kind of tell us like, here is what we built, and this is what it is for you. A concrete example is a project from Meta, from Facebook. It's from the NLLB project, No Language Left Behind. And in there, um, what the what the company has done is basically they they gathered um, whatever data they could find on the web on different languages, two hundred plus languages, um, created a, a humongous model, a single model that can translate between these languages. A very uh, uh, you know a uh, big achievement really for for engineering, but in there. Uh, there are also like it was overhyped as something that kind of solved machine translation for African languages. Now there are two things I would like to mention there. One, when you uh, actually check the quality of the systems compared to you know tiny startups like Lisan or Ghana NLP, it's another startup that that works in Ghana. The quality is actually uh, poorer. It's worse than you know this uh, this what we provide. But more interestingly, and more importantly, um, around language nuances, you see in, in this kind of languages, uh, when you kind of like uh, put whatever data you find on the web, and you don't actually consult the community and so on, you have no idea of uh, language nuances, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that kind of really keeps me up every day about uh, working in Tigringa is the different kind of dialects in the language. Um, I speak a very different dialect within my mother tongue. That's not quite, you know, the dialect that you find in news or books and so on. But I'm absolutely determined to work uh, towards preserving that because, as you said, there are nuances. There are things that I, I say in my dialect of Tigrinya that I can't quite say in the you know standard form or in the in the in the kind of standard used in in news and so on. Now, for somebody building these technologies, if they're not aware of these nuances, unfortunately, some of these things would be lost in the process. And by kind of empowering technology creators from these communities, we can make sure that these nuances are preserved and and passed on. And, and protected because at the end of the day, they will help us capture a part of our identities uh, that we don't want to lose. So that's a great question. I think there was a part uh, before that that you asked it, I, I didn't quite uh, mention, but uh, on the nuances of languages and, and why this is important, I, I really can't emphasize enough why we should empower um, community members of certain languages to create those language technologies because they do understand and they care about those nuances. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's um, that was really um, interesting to kind of explore that question with you. Um, the first part of the question is was relating to to what you've just said, and I think it's it's really interesting because I think what I was trying to kind of drive at is that in the kind of Google form format, you go, you put a question, and it retrieves all sorts of knowledge for you in a very kind of um, uh, scientific or um, it presents it all as just in one way. It doesn't, it tries not to give an opinion or so any subtext. And I think that's actually the, the beauty of the work that you're producing is that kind of inherent subtext that it, it takes authorship. It reveals authorship as well. And it doesn't try to kind of hide or distance that idea that somebody's created this tool. So in there are stories that they're prioritizing or ways of remembering that they're prioritizing and I just thought it was really fascinating to sort of link that to the question on the screen now about what drives you so in making these decisions what is your kind of process and what stories are you prioritizing in the way that you're developing this tool yeah yeah that's again another um interesting and important question I think I, I, I try to say a few words uh, when I mentioned, you know, our elders as the technologies of memories that served us, you know, by telling us the um, our our history and and really by sharing their wisdom. They were literally the the connectors. And somehow, when we, you know, started when the internet came about thirty years thirty years or so ago, um, it didn't kind of have our elders at the center. It wasn't designed to keep that. 
Um, and you're right. If, you know, as creators of that technology, our elders were um, on the design process, one would think, how would we imagine, you know, that that value, that place that our elders have on the internet as our, you know, um, knowledge creators and, and as uh, as people we relied for wisdom and connection and to be rooted and, and grounded. So that connection is lost because it's not really encoded in the design principles of the internet. And mm. um, yeah, uh, so it's, it's a fascinating question. And I think it would be an interesting question for those of us who are uh, building, whether it's language technologies or, or other parts of the internet to kind of see how we could bring that back. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for the presentation. It was really fascinating to get, to get a glimpse into this world that I didn't know very much about before. And I was wondering if um, maybe you could speak a bit more about the kind of role of uh, the internet and these technologies, like especially within kind of conflict zones. So you were speaking about how um, you'd started the project before before the war broke out back home. And, and I imagine that it's kind of given it a certain urgency ever since. And you you were speaking about how, in a way, often these same technologies can be used productively, but also misused depending on the hands that they fall within. And I wonder how you kind of navigate that within your work or how you kind of think about that question and, and also what tools or technologies um, are there to kind of try and mediate that, that tension? Yeah. That's a wonderful, wonderful question. And um, I must say, uh, this conflict has even made me more aware and more convinced of uh, this idea of how technology could be super powerful, both uh, to do good and to do the, the most harm. Um, uh, you know, when the drone technologies came, you might have seen this startup that was kind of using it to uh, sheep blood to rural areas in, in Rwanda. What a fascinating use of like, you know, uh, drone technology really to save lives. And it was so devastating for me. Uh, and really there were some sleepless nights when uh, the same drone technology was used to bombard kindergartens um, and church and mosques in, in Tigray. And it's it's so unfortunate uh, that, you know, to, to come to the question, there are no really bodies who, who decide, you know, who should own or, you know, who should command a, a given piece of technology. That said, that's unfortunate that we don't have anybody. Uh, the UN, we might have different opinions in here. Uh, and if there's any anything that I have come close to realize about the United Nations is um, how it hasn't been um, concretely, you know, super helpful for victims when, when they were hopeless uh, in, in the face of, you know, uh, the technology that was being used against them. So, yeah, the role of technology in, in crisis, in conflicts, uh, it's huge. I think it can help us to do a lot of good, but at the hand of the wrong people, it could also um, cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm. And as you know, architects and software engineers and researchers, you know, uh, whatever our profession here, I think it's very, very important to always, always remember whatever we're building, and if possible, to put safeguards uh, to make sure that they they don't, uh, yeah, they're not at the hands of the wrong people. Can you can you expand a bit more on that? I mean, I think this idea that digital space isn't immediately accessible, accessible is very fascinating. But then the kind of on the other side of that is that it kind of needs almost like an ethical framework to ensure its accessibility, but also its kind of use. I wondered if you at Dare or at Lesan have a sort of ethical code, ethical framework that you use when building your technologies or your softwares? Yeah. Yeah. What wonderful question. There is um, a code of conduct and code of research uh, from Deere. That's that's amazing. I'm pretty much um, 
a student at that. So really learning, uh, coming from purely uh, computer science background uh, from undergrad uh, up until my graduate studies. Um, but yes, there is a, a code of conduct. I'll be happy to share the link maybe afterwards uh, for the, the their ethical considerations. Um, I can share some of the things I have learned over the past you know few months uh, working at Dare and alongside with the fascinating people uh, like Tim Needs and and others at Dare. Um, and this is uh, this has to. It's first first and foremost is directly relevant to Lisan because we're building you know, AI systems, um, many people frame this as something that, you know, few engineers and researchers do. It, it, it's not. It requires, you know, current AI technologies require a lot of annotated data, a lot of data that involves like people telling it, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer, and so on, labeling. And that practice currently is really bad because there are no rules uh, around how, you know, uh, we should treat uh, people that work on this uh, on this on these things. Um, so one concrete thing I, I learned at there, and I try to practice every day, is basically how uh, to kind of make this as a dignified job as possible. And these people that work on this the labeling tasks are not uh, some kind of um, you know just because they happen to be on. The receiving end and they don't have many alternatives uh i don't have to kind of decide like the wage here is how much something causes to it uh and really to be mindful uh and, and to create those for th this is at the practice level as an engineer as somebody who builds this technologies daily how i incorporate kind of like this these lessons um but it's it's more than just as a as a practice of somebody who builds these things is um you know all, all these questions of like if listen builds uh you know machine translation there has to be a body that makes sure that this technology doesn't cause harm we don't have those kind of uh bodies now established bodies that control um just like you know we have bodies that control we don't produce food that you know poisons people we should have uh bodies that could you know that decide um whether a piece of technology is good um, for, for the public, and we don't have that. There are other areas that I couldn't go to because that's actually not my specific uh, expertise, but happy to share some of the, the amazing work uh, that, that happens at the you know, intersection of ethics and AI and, and all that there. I um I I wonder if you could also just expand for our benefit on this um the kind of labeling task as a, as a role and and what that process is and what it means how does how is that done deciding whether or not something is good data or bad data yeah absolutely so currently for example at Lisan we're building a automatic speech recognition system so we want to give our machine a piece of uh, sound like in Tigrinya salam alam and out comes the corresponding characters salam alam hello world um, now, to build this technology, uh, the current practice is basically you need thousands and thousands of um, audio uh, snippets and their corresponding text. Now, you can approach this you know, in a multitude of ways. Really, at the heart is basically some native speakers have to record themselves or you, know, you give them recorded audio and they have to transcribe that. And you need thousands and thousands of this, uh, maybe millions. Now, at the one extreme, you can be... Open AI and go to the internet and you know gather whatever data you can find and put it on a giant and humongous model and say, hey, I've created the, the world's best model. And uh, here's the millions of dollars that were spent. And this is the best technology. Um, we pose and we follow a different approach. Uh, and it is, we reach out to our communities. We say, look, we have we have different you know, dialects I mentioned earlier of Tigrinya. Let's try to sample as as you know as much as possible from the different dialects because we don't want to take whatever is just used on the news, which happens to be the one very specific kind of dialect of Tigrinya. Or let's try to make sure that we have different age groups and different uh, gender. This is a very different kind of approach to you know going on the web, getting gathering everything you could find and putting it um, uh, as a system and. Coming back to that specific, what does labeling look like? 
at least for automatic speech recognition, we send a piece of text and then they read it. So, you know, text and, and audio, or we send um, an audio snippet and then they give us the corresponding um, the corresponding text. Yeah. Uh, for machine translation, it's different. You give them some source text in English, for example, and they give you the translation into Gringa or the other way around. Uh, it, these kind of labeling tasks depend on the kind of uh, particular task you're working on. Okay. Um, I have I have one more question, sort of returning back to the role of kind of language and um, I suppose in relation to our title of this lecture series, the kind of imagination. And I'm wondering what role you see your work playing in um, helping others um, imagine imagine otherwise or, or imagine in new possibilities. And the reason I ask that is linked to this thing about um, the kind of inefficiencies or inadequacies of the English language to capture other people's way of living or dwelling or being in the world. And um, I'm thinking often of, um, of like, you know, students that or um, other people that don't, maybe for them, English is not their first language and the job of always having to kind of work between translating your native tongue into English um, before then being able to communicate that, especially in a subject area, especially, you know, with specialized languages, architecture slows down that kind of imagination. If you're always having to um, uh, sort of um, uh, make space or champion somebody else's language or mother tongue over your own and how that limits your freedom to imagine. And I wonder what, how you see your work playing a role in the kind of um, allowing others to imagine um, more freely or in a much more embodied way. Sorry, I don't know if that's clear, but. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Even though you were putting it as a question, I think there were like spot on expressions and phrases that I would love to borrow. Um, <laughs> language, language does impact our imagination. I absolutely wholeheartedly believe in that. Mm. And part of um, something I'd like to, to mention is basically in, in my most kind of creative uh, periods, I'm, I'm actually like really out thinking in Tigringa, mm -hmm. not just Tigringa, in my dialect of Tigringa. I can't mm -hmm. emphasize that enough in the kind of, because many people that speak the dialect of Tigringa that I speak, when they go into media and they have to express themselves, they have to switch to the mm -hmm. standard form. And in that process, you see them like lose instead of focusing on the stuff they want to say on the important things they are lost in that translation of you know fitting in to that dialect and so on now add to that you have to think in english and and other other languages instead of you know your mother tongue i i believe it um absolutely helps if we can all think and imagine in our languages in our mother tongue because um, there are realms of our emotions and, and other things that I, you know, as much as I feel like I, I understand and speak English in, in, you know, there are moments and, and times that I cannot say the things I want to say as much as mm -hmm. I would love uh, yeah. the stuff I could say into Gringa. So language um, does determine how we can feel freely think and create and hopefully you know, allowing people to use piece of technology to just use their language uh, contributes to that. I would love, you know, for people to use the keyboards that we create so we can hear the best authors in Tigringa that can share their stories, not just for, for me personally, but also to the world, because it's part of our, you know, uh, shared um, culture as, as humans. Uh, so I believe it contributes uh, yeah. to that. <clears throat> Thank you. I think it's a really important um way of kind of framing this especially in our in our school community which is so international and how often um to have to translate first before you can imagine is such a it it, it weakens your kind of um creativity or freedom to to express what you you know inherently so yeah i just thought it was important to kind of discuss that in especially in relation to our school community that's a wonderful point. Yeah. I agree. 
Thank you. I wonder if we open it up. Um, there are a number of questions, I think, or hands that have been raised. Um, Julius, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you for your for your wonderful uh, for your wonderful talk and and all the ideas you um, you were expressing. So I'm I'm from just one word. I'm from the DW, DW Academy in Germany. We are working on media projects, uh, and I myself was involved or I'm involved in a media project in in, uh, in Addis. We work together with the media, uh, Mercer Media Institute. I was there also two times, and I I loved it, and so. Um, I have lots of questions, so my, maybe one just technical question um, is: Is this um, technology uh, already in use, and, and and in what kind of scope, or in what kind of context or projects? And my 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 question is: uh, Have you worked together with media houses, and what what are your what are your ideas for applying the technology? Uh, together with media houses or, or partners like that. Hmm. Wonderful. Should I just go or do we accept more questions first? Uh, I think we could do one by one. Also, do you want to maybe stop sharing your screen so that we can see? Um... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> much better. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Julius, for, for this wonderful question. Uh, DW Academy, I've seen some of the work uh, you guys do in Addis. Actually, uh, we were at a co-working space in Addis called Ice Addis. Uh, yes. And I think we might have met some of your, your team, as, as I mentioned in one of the visits I said when we were working in the ground. Um, the I think they also... <laughs> Yeah, the technology is already deployed. Uh, you can, you know, find us at uh, Lysander AI. So if you, you know, HTTP, you know, at Lysander AI, you will find it. Media houses have been actually our number one target because, mm -hmm. because of the sheer amount of data from uh, media media companies like news and, and, and so on. The, the current translation system works pretty well for news compared to other genre, say, um, like in, in medical uh, domain or or legal domain or other domains. Uh, so we'd be happy to to partner if, uh, you know, this is an, you know, it's a good way to, <laughs> to partner and reach out. Uh, but yeah, the technology is already deployed and it's in use. And we're absolutely happy to partner with media companies um, to increase their reach. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um... There was a question in the chat. I think it was after um, Julius's that I might maybe reach out, uh, read out. Unless Jeff, if you wanted to ask, no. Okay. Um, so Jeff's asking: Indigeneity is a concept that lots of folks throughout the world don't particularly identify with. But I'm wondering if, in your spaces, there are certain principles like indigenous data sovereignty that you can relate to in your work. I'm thinking in terms of the communal or collective nature of data, especially language and cultural data, and how that creates certain challenges in collective data governance. Yeah, wonderful question. Um, I think um, we have that sense of, you know, indigenous, um, th this, this is our collective kind of uh, uh, property or you know we have to care for our language and so on but it's not well developed in the sense that we don't have principles or they are not codified you won't find them anywhere if you go to Ethiopia or to Tigray and you want to read about you know data sovereignty about Tigrinya uh, you won't find it but there is that lived experience that I want to share that if you talk to any Tigrayan or you know somebody who speaks Tigrinya uh, there is that sense of like this is our common thing. Somebody who has, you know, nothing to do with translation. As soon as they learn, I'm I'm working on an automatic speech recognition uh, on on machine translation system for Tigrinya. They go out of the way and say, "What can I do to contribute to that?" Because they have that sense of like, "Well, this I, I, we belong to this." Um, 
I think there is that kind of lived experience, but I wish we had some of the experiences like, uh, you know, in New Zealand, uh, there's this uh, amazing initiative about uh, data sovereignty and so on, where, you know, the, um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm forgetting some specific names I want to say about the language, uh, but they want to preserve their language and they want to make sure that whatever is built around that language serves that community. And I think that's something we could learn from, uh, whether it's for, for Tigringa, for other African languages or, you know, others. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great concept, uh, data sovereignty. There is lived experience. There is no um, rule or manifesto or anything you would find for Tigring or Amharic. Great, thank you. Um, is it Marda? I think we have another raised hand. Hi. Hello. Uh, um, thank you for the presentation, also for the work as much. Uh, this was a little bit to do with uh, a prior idea of um, preservation of language and imagination. We can't. Uh, so I had kind of quite difficult to hear you. Yeah, it's quite hard to understand what you're saying. You're you're very muffled. Uh, try again. It's working now? Yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, I was just saying thank you for the presentation, but uh, also just to relate to this question of um, what gets lost in terms of uh, imagination. I had sort of an anecdote that I was hoping to follow into a question. Um, so I've done some some uh, architectural work uh, in Tigray. Uh, in Tigray, um, I, this is a kind of side note, but it's um, sedimentary rock. The whole place is just marble and granites and all of this stuff. So um, as a building practice, people in Tigray are incredibly skilled at putting up a kind of a stone uh, constructs very, very quickly. Uh, but CAD softwares don't take Tigrinya or Amharic. You have to put it in English before you get things issued. Um, so we have uh, one uh, marble, for example, that direct translation is Uh So if you translate one level further, Ibnibarad means cold stone because it cools places down. That's it. But uh, something like uh, limestone, which is also very common, is called Ibnibidig. Bidig means just to get up very quickly uh, because that's what they use for traditional construction. Like they can knock out a house. I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. Five, six days because in the bit it goes up but it was a really strange situation where uh because we had to issue these drawings in english uh okay. we have to write marble and limestone and suddenly the entire construction method shifted wow. because they know how to handle in the they know how to handle in the but marble and limestone which are the same material have mm -hmm. a different embodied practice for having been written in english um, so that was the anecdote, but the question was what gets lost in, in the in-between of this translation, even if it is a direct translation, there is somehow an embodied use of it that disappears. So in what ways can machine learning help to bridge that gap? Uh, and sort of where do you see that, uh, the cultural aspect of language being able to fit into these softwares? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Anikta. That's excellent. And I wish I could, um, I wish I added a bit part of like the, you know, the architectural side of Tigray, because this is a region that has a long and, and beautiful history, but um, I didn't kind of bring that side. So at least thank you for sharing a bit of a bit of that. Um, the role of machine learning and, and technology in kind of preserving. Uh, so so we're, we're now talking about a, a specific you know, uh, technical kind of terminology or technical uh, translation. Um, I hope that one of the the roles that technology and, and machine learning can play is basically bringing us all together on that quest for how should we do this? How should we approach that translation problem? It will unify the efforts of architects and, and, and you know, um, medical doctors who also care about, you know, specific differences, subtle differences in translation that are actually very critical for health and, and across all the other sectors. And I, I hope that technology and this kind of um, 
initiatives and what we're building can help us unify our um, our practices because what we use, for example, to curate and, and solve some of these hard problems for architectural terms might be useful when we approach the same problem in another domain, say in biology or, or chemistry or other technical terms. So that, that's the one thing I see. Apart from that, I don't believe that, you know, technology per se does solve these kind of problems for us. Um, you know, machine learning is at the end of the day, as, as I was trying to allude to, uh, you know, learning from what people feed it and what people feed it is basically what architects or, you know, people, professionals like yourself would, would say, this should be the translation of that. That should be that the translation. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it just brings us all together and, and helps us to systematically uh, solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, from Chris, who's asking if you could repeat the name of the company in Ghana that do um, similar work to Lesan. So yes, uh, Ghana NLP. Uh, they actually have a very easy name to remember. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, oh, um, Mara? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you just muted yourself. Hello? You're yes. back. Yeah, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for all the work you're doing because I think it's so much needed by the project. Um, but I did have a couple of questions. One technical, and one not very technical. But so, like you did mention that, like there's not much of the like digital data work to bring up like, on the internet, and we know like most of the big companies when it comes to machine learning, they mainly train their data on. Uh, they mainly train them like models with data on the internet. So like, how exactly are you coming to like to tackle that? Like how, how are you training your models with that? Like you did mention with speech recognition that um, you ask people to read out words and things like that. But how are you exactly like coming to maybe save the language? Like how are you getting to train your models if there's not much of like digital data with the grain yeah. Um, so I'm not sure, like, um, you know, as much as I would love to share all of the details of what we do, um, some of it is basically our, uh, yeah, our moat in a way. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll just mention some approaches, uh, some general approaches. So if you want, <clears throat> if you want to gather uh you know, data on specific dialects. So you can start from some themes, some topics, for example, uh, stuff about architecture, right? Now you could give the topic to people from different parts of Tigray and tell them, can you give me some words? What, what kind of words uh, come to your mind when you think about these topics? And so this way you're able to capture not just different names and so on, but also that kind of subtlety that we were talking about, that richness in the you know, dialects of, of that language. Um, that's just one of many approaches we use to kind of like uh, make sure that you know, different dialects are gathered. Um, we do actually use data from the internet. Uh, I, you know, we don't rule that out because there is actually a lot of data on the web, um, but we don't solely, solely rely on that. And I was just mentioning one of the problems of relying on, you know, purely you know, web data is, uh, and, and especially if you don't have people uh, that do understand this language and so on, is you might run into the problem of mixing different languages and treating them as one. Uh, as I was giving a practical example from the NLLB project in Meta, uh, a project that has been, you know, making headlines as, as, you know, the breakthrough for machine translation, including for African languages, you look at the data they use for Amharic and you see that many of the, a lot of text is actually Tigringa. Or you look at the Tigringa and a lot of text is actually, you know, other languages. And uh, by working closely with communities and by being rooted and being part of that community, we don't make that kind of mistake. And yeah. Uh, just another question as well. 
So you um, we know that like in our communities, like there isn't much of like internet access. So how exactly are we like are you thinking of tackling that issue and giving the people access to this uh, technology? That's a wonderful question. And I think the bigger question there, instead of maybe just talking about little listen, is really the internet is more, you know, for, for those of us who are able to take advantage of this, this is such a, you know, amazing invention in a way with all its problems. Um, one of the main problems with the internet today, uh, just like any piece of technology, is at the, at the hands of the wrong governments governments that can just, you know, use a switch and turn on and off, depending whether, you know, they like you or, or not. Um, this has been the main problem for, for Tigray for the past couple of years. It's been shut down from the internet for two years. Um, I think that's the main problem we should talk about. Uh, then, you know, how is, you know, a small startup being able uh, is is gathering data using you know the internet and so on because that's such a fundamental and, and critical problem not just for Tigray but across other you know um, regimes and um, what can we do to solve that I would pose it as a question because I don't have the answers for that. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Julius. Is, did you have another question? Yes, um, so so everybody, and you also um, is talking about ChatGPT and all these transformer models. And you are you are you were talking about your your work when you transform, um, yeah, one language in, into the others and uh, and make it more accessible. But ChatGPT and all these uh, these other machines are creating artificial content, and it's it's another another approach. So. I don't know the, the real question for me. Do you see something like an AI divide in the future that that uh, all the big investors are spending their the billions in these uh, companies now, and then they, we we will see new mono, monopolies uh, in that field, and then everybody is we have the same situation like social media uh, dominated by by a handful of countries. So what, what is maybe it's too big for a question, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and I can project it also as an interesting question. Um, but I'm also happy to take on uh, and and share my my thoughts on that. So ChatGPT and and others, one, um, they rely on vast amounts of data, like with minimal kind of filtering, um, and as we all know, data on the web uh, is biased. Um, it is over represented by the lucky few who have the luxury to contribute on the web for historical and other reasons. Many communities and, and their voices are not actually on the web. So this, this technology is built on, you know, vast swaths of this kind of uh, text data will have their own issues and their own problems. Um, that's already an issue. Um, the other issue is there are these kind of small startups uh, that are community rooted and so on that are tackling these problems. Now, for me, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, one of the, you know, unfortunate things is that these kind of technology companies, they release something, they overhype it, and everybody forgets that there are other smaller startups trying to solve key problems. And instead, and this is not just, you know, the average person, but also professionals who should know more rely that this is going to be solved by these uh, tech companies. But um, if we're if we learn from histories, this only kind of perpetuates and, and repeats itself, which is that you know for English languages you will have incremental change by burning billions and billions of dollars, and you have you know hundreds of other languages that are spoken by hundreds of millions of people, if not billions, uh, that are just um, yeah uh, are not treated equally. So that creates an uneven playing field for um, smaller startups like Lisan. But I hope we can change that uh, if <laughs> we kind of deliver, uh, you know, results and, and people start to notice that, well, actually, you know, there are alternative kind of products that, that solve problems for actual people. Hopefully that narrative will change. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm um, oh, sorry, Mave. I was 
Uh, if there's other questions, please do. But maybe um, if I can ask another question, and it's almost in direct opposite to the to the the question before. But uh, I wondered what you thought about programs like Dali, um, uh, and how and again, I guess it's like that. It's in a it's a sort of different definitely different different sphere sphere, but something that's going <coughs> into. Um, yeah, students work, but also architects work in um, this fear of AI replacing creative professionals um, uh, and also issues around copyright and um, a kind of visual bias within visual culture um, and how, I guess, I mean, I, I know that Lesson and, and Dad maybe not directly tackling those AI systems, but how you you kind of discuss this in your um, different um, organizations or startups? Yeah, um, as you say, it's not necessarily the focus, but I think there are underlying kind of questions that whether we're working on image generation, text generation, um, or you know other related AI technologies, at the core is basically you know, what is this technology used for? Is it, you know, what is the intended use? There should always be like a guiding principle that should say, you know, it, the, the, it should be clear, this is the good that we're going to do. If it's not, then we have to have rules, we have to have policies, you know, that, that prevent these kind of technologies. On the kind of production side, I mentioned a bit about, you know, these systems, no matter how, you know, uh, AI engineers and and practitioners try to put them as, you know, it's like some genius sitting somewhere creating this thing. That's not the reality. The reality is these are machines that are learning from previous examples that were made by humans. And the question there is, are you ethically compensating people that are kind of labeling the data for you? Uh, or are you just stealing data from, from you know, wh whoever, whether it's like artists or, or other architects who, you know, created these things? So there should be, you know, clear discussions around this, regardless of what the specific technology is. The pipeline is quite clear. How do you, how do you acquire the data um, uh, and for what intended uses? And then the deployment. Um, what are kind of the measures uh, in place so that these these things don't don't create um, you know unintended consequences? Um, I don't have like specific uh, critics around around this apart from the fact that you know this is also made by technology companies that happen to kind of scrape the web and uh, in some cases without the consent of like the creators, and then that creates the kind of complication which is I just mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also had another question, which was um, slightly on a different topic, but um, I was just wondering how you, whether within the sun, but also dare, what your, um, I guess, who your collaborators are, because I imagine maybe you're also working with not just um, engineers, but linguists, I'm guessing, or at least when you're maybe starting some of the work off. And, and, I, and I wonder if there, there are other disciplines that kind of inform your work and, and what those conversations are like. Yeah. Uh, so I can, I can talk in both ways, but I think DARE is this wonderful example of how things are done. So at DARE, you have um, people from across disciplines that are always coming together and talking AI from different perspectives. You have journalists and activists there, you have uh, labor organizers, you have people who, who build the systems like myself, and you have, um, uh, you know, researchers that have done across the board and everyone is just coming together uh, as peers and discussing, uh, you know, themes uh, on, on a particular uh, thing. And the, the beautiful part around having this kind of diverse um, expertise and kind of diff diverse uh, perspectives is that you, you, you just... Um, yeah, you know, it's it's a humbling experience for me to begin with, because the way I used to build things before, which is, you know, my canonical like computer science hat and, you know, there's this problem, cast it as a technical problem and just try to solve it versus, no, there are many, many issues along the way that you're actually making decisions for without even being aware. What kind of tigrinya, what kind of, you know, 
language are you tackling and why? What kind of uh, specific area is this mission translation that you're prioritizing for? And these all these questions that I would just overlook and overgloss and go now because of the practice that's encouraged at there, I have to pose and and you know think and and see all the kind of decisions I'm I'm making and I think that's the proper way of doing it. <clears throat> Great, thank you. And, and so, for example, then specifically in the work that you do, was there an initial period where you were discussing um, the kind of structure of the languages or how languages come together more from a kind of, um, yeah, I suppose, linguistic position? Yeah. So if you're, if you're, got, I can give you a concrete and practical example of um, how this interdisciplinary kind of team is helping us uh, shape our projects at Lisan. So, for example, when we go out and, and gather um, speech data for Fertigrina, we have to talk about, you know, the different linguistic diversities to make sure, as I was saying, are you making sure that different uh, groups are involved, um, you know, across age, gender, uh, across dialects, um, and then linguistically speaking, all uh, you know the phonemes are all the sounds being represented. How do you approach that, and and so on? These are not necessarily the questions like a typical machine learning engineer kind of approach the problem. The, the way you take it from school is like just go get the data wherever you can find it and build some something and then iterate over it. Versus no, like first design. This is. This is how it should be. And then think about where to go and collect it. Another perspective and interesting in, insight and, and feedback I got from a sociologist is when you send out these tasks to, you know, to the people that are helping us label this, <clears throat> instead of saying like, here's a micro task or, or piecework for you, complete it. And, you know, we'll, we'll give you this. I have started to kind of cast this as a, as a relationship in a way, you know, these community members this is it's it's partly their uh, creation as well, and so instead of like just go complete this task, I'm into more like how long does this thing take, and how you know how can we do this hourly or monthly instead of you know piece work, which is what I used to do before, um, you know consulting sociologists because for sociologists it's very important that we don't treat humans like um, you know interchangeable factory parts, and instead treat them as dignified and and you know when you create this kind of jobs uh to make sure that you you are you are bringing that those things i wouldn't imagine if i was just purely following my machine learning uh kind of training and and just attacking this problem with that i had an, another question if that's okay about um the kind of future i guess future goals for for Lasan, um, and and I guess within the context of sort of working against the status quo or the grain of 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 like maybe bigger companies, Google, Meta, etc. Um, if there was an ambition to perhaps like rather than collaborate with them, really just um, prioritize this new way of uh building software and and considering software and and kind of continuing i mean it's quite a broad, broad thing and um but uh continuing you know going against the grain and uh yeah integrating other african languages yeah that that's a great question and um we are in discussions with like uh, similar startups in you know other parts of africa to kind of create and and partner together um mm -hmm. you know serving our own respective communities but also joining hands on, on on a bigger scale to to serve kind of bigger customers uh which is which i'm really looking forward to i i hope that kind of model uh shows and and, and really works mm -hmm. Um, another thing is, again, the motivation for me is if this technology happens to actually um, create a substantial um, change, whether it's in education system or in bringing health information to my communities, um, that's that's the goal. That's the Northern Star uh, for, for Lisan. Uh, it's not necessarily, am I, you know, dominating the world? Do we have? <laughs> that's not. World domination is not on, on, my, on my agenda at all. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Comment from Jeff, but I think that's it. It. Yeah. Uh, if not, then I think maybe it's a good note to end on. Thank you. It's been really fascinating hearing you speak more about the projects. Um, and like I said, it's it's. I think it's a it's a world that we're we're not so familiar with as architects in some ways. And in some ways, there's loads of kind of um, common questions that I think we're sort of tackling, but but through a different lens. So it's really interesting to hear you speak about it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so glad. To... Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So <clears throat> Jeff did raise his hand. I'm just conscious. Should we? Ah, sorry. I didn't see. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff, do you want to unmute? Yes, I know. Um, so just uh, really quickly, because I know that it's kind of awkward to jump in at the last minute, but so much of what you shared, um, so a bit about me, like I'm Kerrigan Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, Indigenous from so-called Canada and all that jazz. And like so much of what you've articulated is so common in like Indigenous, like language revitalization, cultural revitalization, resurgency movements, like all these kinds of things that we're, we're also figuring about how can we utilize technologies in ways that don't inadvertently like further the colonial projects that, you know, uh, encompass our territories and lands. And so I guess that's why I was just asking about like that label of indigeneity. Not a lot of folks are comfortable with it, even though like lots of communal folks around the world still kind of share similar challenges in terms of like the conflicts inherent from colonialism, you know, and, and what you're describing about fact that we're even having this conversation in English when that's not necessarily the language we'd prefer to use. And so I'm just, I, I don't have a particular question. I was just curious about like just that alignment between like the work that you're doing and then these larger like indigenous movements across the world and how we're, we're doing such similar kinds of work. And I'm always curious how we can help each other kind of piggyback off these challenges. Mm. I guess yeah. that's why I'm kind of jumping in like this. No, no, that's that's great. I, and I think you, yeah, you told us a, a, an interesting point around, you know, indigenous communities, indigenous languages, and so on. And I think one of the the things we can all collaborate and help is, you know, through practices. As I, I was trying to mention about this uh, data sovereignty kind of policy, a blog post um, I was suggested by my friend Timnik Gavru, and I still hold dear very very nice and I, I wish I could share share that you might have read it already it's from New Zealand and it's about um kind of how they try to view their data they as um you know they are the guardians of their data they don't talk about you know I own you own that that data it's you know we're the guardians of our our data and um they have data policies around who can build technology around this and if you build technology then to make sure that it benefits that community and uh because they came together and drafted those things they are inspiring us like they're inspiring me personally to follow you know their code of conduct and maybe introduce it to to my communities as well because i truly believe uh in in, in how they are they are approaching it and i believe it's it's the right way um, to do that. So in our respective kind of communities, if if we kind of uh, share best practices uh, and inspire each other, then we can absolutely preserve our culture, uplift each other, and so on. <clears throat> yeah, hopefully forums like this are connecting more, more people together and, and yeah, having more. Absolutely. There's a comment in the... Uh chat i don't know if you've seen it as me but it's or, or maybe it's at jeff sorry um oh, a reference great. to carpentry con 2022 care principles mm. cool um awesome. any other <coughs> Excuse me. uh cool if not we will let you go i think you're an hour ahead of us as well aren't you so it's late for you there <laughs> um, but thanks so much for joining us. It's been really, yeah, really fascinating. And thanks Thank for you so much. Well.
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Asma. Amazing. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Another one next week. It's Huda Tayyub. Yes. So see you there. We'll be back in the uh, AA, so we'll see you in person next week. Thank you.